Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a delight to be back. It is such a delight to be back to the fold of NPTEL. Uh, basically, uh, I <coughs> I fondly remember the days of 2003 down the memory lane. Professor M. S. Anand, the then director of IIT Madras, started the new paradigm called NPTEL. The NPTEL was a movement. Professor Mangal Sundar from IIT Madras, Professor Onup Ray from IIT Kharagpur, Professor Kushal Sen from IIT Delhi, <coughs> Professor R. K. Shivgaonkar from IIT Bombay. Professor Mohanti from IIT Rurki, Professor Nandi from IIT Guwahati, Professor N.J. Rao from Indian Institute of Science, and myself from IIT Kanpur. We were the soldiers to take the movement forward. Lots of hard work, lots of arguments, lots of fun, and lots of learning. Since then, Plenty of changes have taken place. Now, hundreds of institutes are in the fold of NPTEL. Everywhere, there are new coordinators. The present coordinator of IIT Kanpur is Professor Satyaki Ray, who is deeply associated with NPTEL since when I was a coordinator. It is doubly delightful for me to participate in a NPTEL organized program once again and deliver a talk that is ex expected to be useful to thousands of young minds across the country. The title of my talk is, Is Academia a Vanguard of Industrial Revolutions? The talk will unfold many interesting paradigms of science and its impact on technology development. I am thankful to the organizers, specifically Professor Mangal Sundar, Professor Pratap Haridas, Professor Andrew Thangaraj, and Shataki for giving me this opportunity and inviting me. I am deeply indebted to Dr. Sri Balaji and other staff members of NPTEL of IIT Madras and NPTEL of IIT Kanpur for providing me lots of help. I am also deeply indebted to one of my friends, Professor Sirup Rai Chaudhuri of TIFR, for many useful discussions related to this thought, related to this talk I will present today. If we go back by 5,000 years, ancient civilizations, we'll see, I mean, <coughs> existence of ancient civilizations at Greece, India, China, Babylonia, and existence of Mayan civilization. They knew many mathematical results. They were strong in science. They worked on human values. Uh, if we specifically uh, take up the case of India, we will find many scholars. The foremost one is Aryabhatta. He became immortal for his greatest discovery of zero. Also, he calculated value of pi very close to the exact value. We, get, we uh, understand, you know, Lady Pingala's contribution also in mathematics. And one of the students of Brahmagupta, one of the students of Aryabhatta, Brahmagupta, who uh, discovered negative numbers. Now, after the Industrial Revolution, the Western countries began to reap the fruits of industrialization. The waves of Industrial Revolution and the uh, Cultural Revolution, which is called Renaissance, uh, touched India which was the then a British colony. Between 1850 and 1900, five modern universities 
were set up. First one was Calcutta in 1857 August. Immediately after Bombay, then Madras, Allahabad, and finally in Lahore. And it used to be known as Punjab University. And later, after independence, it was divided. Uh, it was in undivided Lahore, it undivided India. So then the Punjab University, PANJB, that came to India and Punjab University remained in Pakistan. But both the universities produced Nobel laureates. Between 1900 and 1947, 16 more universities were added. The notable ones are Benaras Hindu University, which was founded by Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya, 1915, University of Mysore, Osmania University, Aligarh Muslim University, and Delhi University. The Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Calcutta, was founded in, 17, in 1876. This was the first research institute in India started with dedicated research program and financially was supported by Dr. Mahendra Lal Sarkar. Indian History of Science, Bangalore, it was established in 1909 by Jamshed Tata. This was also a dedicated research institute. At that time, it used to be called Tata Institute. Today, IISC is the epitome of scientific research in India. The celebrated Raman effect was discovered in this Indian Association of Cultivation of Science in 1928. K. S. Krishnan started the pioneering work on modern magnetism and structural physics also there. Within a short period of setting up modern university system, India could produce 12 fellows of Royal Society of London. And you can see the name. It includes Ramanujan, Sri, uh, I mean, sir, J.C. Bose, Sir C.V. Raman, Meghna Saha, Birbal Sahani, K.S. Krishnan, Hami Jahangir Baba, Sir S.S. Bhatnagar, S. Chandra Shekhar, Mahalanabis, and D.N. Bhadia. In 1888, Heinrich Hartz established Maxwell's electromagnetic theory through generating electromagnetic waves of wavelength 660 millimeter. Sometime later, Sir J.C. Bose devised a wave transmission device at 5 millimeter wavelength and uh, it could receive and transmit waves. Bose demonstrated his work on Hertzian wave radiation at the Royal Institute London in 1986. Pierce suggested him to take patent, but he refused to took, uh, take patent. He used to believe uh, in a different philosophy. Uh, he did not want to put the financial burden on the society from where he drew all his material. His revolutionary experiments on electrical response of living and non-living entities were another paramount contribution of modern science. Finally, India's dream of uh, having Nobel Prize in science became reality in 1930. Sir C. V. Raman got Nobel Prize for his work on scattering of light and for discovery of an effect which is named after him. Then Professor S. N. Bose, his name will automatically come. He was a physicist, what we call today as mathematical physics in that sense. He was nurturing mathematical physics and together with Einstein he founded Bose Einstein statistics. This opened the door to the discovery of bosons, a class of subharmonic particles that are carriers of force. All of us know 
that Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013 was awarded jointly to Engelhardt and Peter Higgs and the particles that they discovered are known as Higgs boson or God's particle, which was a thought of Professor S. N. Bose long ago. Meghnad Saha in 1919, his discovery of Saha ionization formula, which is crucial to understanding the spatial classification of stars and determination of their temperature. Then we can very proudly talk about G. N. Ramchandran, his discovery of the triple helix structure of collagen, a protein found in uh, connective tissue. Ramchandran's Feishai plot has become a standard description of protein structure. Then Professor J. V. Narlikar, uh, all of us know uh, it is in the physics textbook, while Nardical theory it synthesizes Albert Einstein theory of relativity and Max principle. Sienna Rao, Chintamuni Nagesh Ramchandra Rao, the very, very well known name in Indian academia, one of the world's foremost solid state and material chemist, widely respected among the chemistry and physics fraternity. Hargobind Khorana, 1968 Nobel Prize in Medicine, went to him for the genetic code. Then Subramaniam Chandrasekhar for the structural evolution of stars. Nobel Prize winner of 1983. Venkat Ramakrishnan, 2009, he got Nobel Prize for his studies of structure, structure and function of ribosome. Currently, he is president of the most prestigious acad academy in the world, Royal Society. Ashok Shen, 2012 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics was <coughs> won by him and he opened the path to re the realization that all string theories are different limits of the same underlying theory. Now quickly we will turn to Europe. Uh, the, uh, among the ancient civilizations I mentioned about, uh, the Greek civilization is unique because it's always stressed on logical proofs. And we will take very few examples, but all the examples, I mean, are such that we use the fruits of it even today. Thales theorem to draw, uh, I mean, uh, right angle very quickly within a circle. Even today, Masons used it, use it. Pythagoras theorem, the theorem is the cornerstone of all coordinate geometry mechanics and linear algebra. Pythagoras is a household name, even our you know, children study about Pythagoras. Uh, then we'll talk about Ptolemy of Alexandria. Uh, he described complete uh, planetary motions using the idea of epicycles, which are today known as the Fourier series. Till Kepler emerged, Ptolemy's Almagest remained the standard textbook in positional astronomy. Then Plato. Plato has plenty of contributions, but geometry, you know, of regular solids is his foremost contribution. Even today, it is the cornerstone of modern physics. Diophantus of Alexandria um, <coughs> is Contribution is algebraic equations. Papa's theorem, even today we use uh, the, his theorems on centroids of revolution are 
extremely useful even today in mechanics, applied mechanics. I'll just touch upon hypatia. Uh, he gave this geometric conic section and I have just to narrate it graphically because I mean you can see a cone if it is cut at different positions it can give circle, ellipse, parabola and hyperbola. The basis of conic sections were uh, developed by him. Science traveled from Greece to Italy, Italy to Germany, Germany to France, England and all over Europe. Galileo Galilei, the father of scientific experiments, you can see Galileo sitting with telescope, it was devised by him. Leibniz worked on differential and integral calculus independently of Isaac Newton's developments. He was the first to describe a pinwheel calculator in 1685. Isaac Newton, English mathematician, physicist, astronomer, theologian, and <coughs> author of Principia that gave precise paradigm of laws of motion and universal gravitation. Boyle, who gave the relationship between pressure and volume of a gas. Charles, he described the relationship between volume and temperature of a gas. Gauss, the greatest mathematician since antiquity. Mathematicians world over even think today that Gauss ranks among the history's most influential mathematician. Euler, he was a physicist, mathematician, astronomer, geographer, and he worked on many, many areas, graph theory, fluid mechanics, topology, analytic number theory, and it's endless is the list. His volume of work, you know, has 39, you know, books. Lavoisier, Lavoisier helped to construct a metric system. He discovered oxygen and hydrogen. You can see Prince Humphrey Davy. He was a baron, but he was a great scientist. He discovered uh, strontium, barium, magnesium, and boron. He invented Davy's lamp, but when he was asked about his contribution to science, his <coughs> reply was very funny. He said that his most you know, prolific contribution in science is Michael Faraday, who was basically his laboratory assistant. Now we'll talk little about Michael Faraday. He has done really endless discoveries and endless studies. The magnetic field around a conductor that carries current was discovered by Faraday. It's called, you know, electromagnetic induction. Then, you know, uh, the principles of electrolysis, diamagnetism, and, you know, uh, other uh, fields like yeah, chemistry, where, you know, electrochemistry is his uh, contribution. He developed Bunsen burner. He discovered benzene. He these words which we use today, anode, cathode, electrode, ion, these are all coined by him. As I said, that probably most impact making scientist in the history. Why I said all these things? See, these, the, the, all these were development and basically, you know, creation of science in contemporary, in that time, all the countries in Europe, but how it developed a product, then uh, it is a sort of uh, fairy tale story. When scientific thought prevailed all over Europe, few people started applying those scientific thoughts on device. And James Watt was first successful to devise 
the steam engine. And just beside this, you can see quickly a movie which is in India today, even it exists and works. It's a fan which is which doesn't run by electricity. It came to India in 1845. Still it works today. I'll not take time. It will take time to explain what it is. It is basically a Starling engine driven fan. And you can see Robert Starling's photograph uh, beside it. And it's a, uh, it's a really a machine in reality. And uh, it's a, star, a Starling engine driven fan which runs without electricity. Uh, I mean, uh, it's an engine basically, Stalling engine. So, I'll quickly go to the uh, engineering education system. As you can see, engineer world was not there uh, before some 200 years. First formal engineering education uh, started in these two institutes I have written. And Equal Polytechnic still exists. It was, it, it started in 1794. Even today, if you go by, go the list of, you know, world ranking, you will find a coveted place is occupied by Equal Polytechnic. It's not one institute today. It's called Grand Equal System. It is spread all over France just like our IIT system. I'll quickly go to uh, evolution of uh, engineering education in Germany. It was the flag bearers were Ferdinand uh, Rettenbacher, uh, who was a mathematician, started engineering practice, developed mechanical engineering through mechanistic models, several paradigms, Heinrich Hertz, who got Nobel Prize, I have already mentioned about it. And he started the electrical engineering department. He was in physics, but he started in electrical engineering department in the University of Karlsruhe. Similarly, Ferdinand Brown, he was also a great physicist and mathematician. He started electrical, uh, he was one of the um, pioneers of electrical engineering education in Karlsruhe University. Professor Fitz Heber, he also got Nobel Prize, Heber's process of ammonia synthesis, for that he got Nobel Prize, and he started chemical engineering in University of Karlsruhe. Now, industrial revolutions in human history created a real impact 1775 can be marked as first in industrial revolution. As I said, it's not one year really, you know, responsible for it, any particular year. Entire Europe, entire, you know, development of scientific thoughts will with that culminated into engineering. And finally, basically steam engine, which converted the, you know, hand loom into power loom, and we, we, we saw also, you know, application of motion in several devices. And second industrial revolution was due to microelectronics. I will go a little more about it. But you can see the growth of GDP because of these two industrial revolutions. And really, you know, civilization started appreciating the fruit of intercontinental business. Uh, I, I was mentioning second in the first industrial revolution, if we make, I mean, just to symbolize, if we say James Watt is responsible for that. Similarly, second industrial revolution, you know, can be much attributed to Professor John Bardeen. He discovered transistor and he got Nobel Prize. He was in University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And you can see his uh, experiment with transistors, how the experimental facility looked like. 
And today, a modern chip consists of millions of billions of transistors. By the way, John Bardeen got another Nobel Prize. In, I mean, there are few in the history of Nobel Prize winners who got two Nobel Prizes. He is one of them. Engineering education in India, we were not the late starter, even though university system was delayed a little bit, but modern university system. But you can see Lieutenant Governor James Thomason was, uh, you know, responsible for setting up engineering school, engineering institute in India, and it was set up uh, at Roorkee, which is today IIT Roorkee in 1847. It was followed by three institutes. All these three institutes are contempor contemporary, although, you know, people keep arguing which one came first, which one came then, but all these three institutes were almost at the same time uh, 1856, uh, Bengal Engineering College, which is IIEST Shippur in the east, Gindi College of Engineering, which is Anna University in south, and College of Engineering Pune in west. Now, impact of Second World War was massive. The rise of new technology, you know, application of radar, microwaves, control system, guided missiles. These were felt all over the world. And in India, I have symbolized it, although I do not know, uh, it, uh, many people may uh, agree with it. I have symbolized with the creation of IIT system, as you can see, the picture of IIT Kharagpur, the first IIT uh, in my slide. So, as I said, first IIT Kharagpur came into existence in 1951, then Bombay 1958, Madras 1959, Kanpur 1960, Delhi 1962. After a gap of 32 years, IIT Guwahati was created in 1994 and IIT Rurki was created or if you say converted from University of Rurki to IIT Rurki in 2001. Today we have 16 new IITs operating in almost all the states of the country. Now different uh, between the IIT system and the prevalent existing system is probably emphasis on master's and PhD program and participation in defense, space, and the programs of atomic energy. Here I would like to mention about, you know, a slight change in engineering education. As I said, engineering education became science-based engineering education, slowly turned into and many engineering scientists started contributing at par with scientists. First name I will take Sir Shishir Kumar Misra, who was FRS, first engineering FRS from the country in 1958. He worked under Mary Curie at Curie Institute. After coming back to India, he started what we call today communication engineering. So he is basically the father of electronics and communication education in India. Earlier, he specialized before working with Marie Curie, he specialized basically in space, in uh, science, means uh, ion sphere, uh, troposphere, and also uh, he's had a significant con contribution in radio astronomy. Then I will take name of Professor M. M. Sharma, who is formerly a you know, uh, great uh, chemical engineer, but his chemical engineering science is, you know, epitome of excellence of chemical engineering, connecting 
chemical sciences to chemical engineering you know in such a way that his work became almost like novel discoveries then i will take the name of professor uh, rudam narsima whose contribution in turbulence is phenomenal absolutely brilliant you know he is considered among the genius in engineering then i will also take name of professor mashilkar who contributed massively in chemical science so basically i wanted to say that from engineering people started contributing in such a way that you know it integrated very uniquely science and engineering and opened up a new paradigm engineers started becoming a force and today it is not you know uncommon one can achieve it now slowly because of these discoveries again technology started taking a turn and this turn is towards miniaturization and and this miniaturization for its low cost for development of variety of sensors for non invasive healthcare system and you know basically you know people started miniaturizing and tending towards small shapes so from bottom up approach from top down approach in technology people started switching over or thinking about not switching over thinking about bottom up approach top down approach you give shape to a material from a base metal from a metallic piece from you produce a metal you know in steel plant or a metal plant process it you use energy you use several techniques to for microfabrication bottom up approach is just mimicking the trees look at a tree it is sown seed see i mean seed is sown and then it draws the exact amount of ingredients it needs from soil it needs from air it needs from sun and it grows into a massive tree it may it may sound as a fairy tale story but this is what is happening in some facets of science now i will quickly you know to discuss this probably i will need help of few scientists so i will focus on some asian science as you can see i have you know shown the flag of india flag of japan flag of korea flag of china flag of vietnam and flag of taiwan so these are the foremost scientific you know innovations happening other countries like malaysia indonesia those are also coming up i'll not you know be able i will not be able to describe all those now uh, china and japan are connected with india through buddhism and it's a historical connection meditation in sanskrit we call dhyana in pali it is jhana in chinese it is chan and in japanese it is zen so zen buddhist monks traveled from india to china and from china to japan carrying with them sublime teachings of lord buddha and one of the outcomes is bonsai as you can see that bonsai was perfected although it is japan it is japanese art but the medicinal plant on herbs were carried from india to china called pens through pensai and then from pensai it was perfected to bonsai to you can see bonsai of a people tree you know a japanese took it or they very much develop bonsai of this people tree uh, because they think that lord buddha sat and attained enlightenment under this tree and uh, this is you know a household item so quickly coming back to the science after i have mentioned about uh, sir c b raman's nobel prize in 1930 the first, second nobel prize came to asia through the physicist nobel prize in science of course because first nobel prize in asia was rabindranath tagore considering you know 
uh, Nobel Prize in Literature also. But Science Nobel Prize, if we talk about, the first was Sir C. V. Raman, then it was Hideki uh, Yukua, and uh, he basically theorized the protons and neutrons in a nucleus. Uh, they are bound by the exchange of light particles, and these particles are pions. He discovered that. And third Nobel Prize in science in Asia came through to Chinese scientists. You can see them here, uh, T. D. Lee and <coughs> C. N. Young. Radioactive beta decay is due to the weak interaction. So they worked on weak, inter weak interaction, which transform, uh, transforms a neutron into a proton an electron and an electron into a neutrino. Now, I will just quickly mention about few Nobel laureates. It's not that, you know, I'm mentioning only about Nobel Prize, but a few Nobel Prizes, uh, these were not really esoteric physical or chemical concept and <coughs> directly contributed into the society. So first I will, you know, name about uh, the uh, uh, I mean three names, Akashi, uh, Isa, Isamu Akashi, Hiroshi Amano, and Professor Nakamura. 2014, they got Nobel Prize for their invention of the effect of <coughs> blue light emitting down, uh, <coughs> sorry, blue light emitting diodes <clears throat> which has enabled bright and energy saving white light sources. So today <clears throat> the uh, light emitting diode, this is a fantastic light source and we know uh, its brilliant usage and uh, at a low power it can illuminate <clears throat> a lot. Similarly, if we talk about organometallic, or, organometallic framework, that was the contribution of a, yet another Nobel Prize by two Japanese scientists, uh, Ishi Negishi and Akira Suzuki. They got Nobel Prize in 2010. And another Nobel Prize I will mention here is Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2012, which is basically a, a work on stem cell and that opened the new door for stem cell therapy. So these three Nobel Prizes changed the world quite a bit. Then I will come to the most impactful discovery, which is called nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are tiny nanostrips of graphene sheet rolled into tubes of a few nanometer diameter and a few tenth of millimeter long. The, this uh, graphene has hexagonal rings. As you can see, uh, the, uh, uh, it was uh, basically invention of Sumio Ijima, an allotropic form of carbon. He is standing here with a model of carbon nanotube. It's really not nanotube because length of this tube, as I said, tenth of few tenth of millimeter and diameter is few nanometer. So when he was awarded for his discovery, he's standing with that award. Uh, it is a model of uh, nanotube. So single wall nanotube and multi wall nanotubes, these are basically, you know, fantastic discovery. You know, uh, this can be used as, you know, conductor, semiconductor, insulator, and this can bring about fantastic, amazing change in, you know, functional aspects of the materials. So this is the climax of basically third industrial revolution, discovery of buckyball structure. 
Now, few other cutting edge uh, sciences from Asia. I will very quickly mention, because the time is uh, running up, out, <coughs> the microprocessor. Uh, this is basically a central processing unit on a single integrated circuit or <coughs> I mean uh, it is basically may be called as you know clock driven register based digital integrated circuit. Fiber optic communication, a method of transmitting information by sending pulses of light through an optical fiber. This is much, much faster than, you know, communications through electrical cables. This all came from, I have although written from Asia, these were developed primarily in Japan. Now, QR code, today we are even storing information of a complete textbook in QR code. It was also developed in Japan. It is a basically a type of barcode. It was designed in 1994 for automotive industry in Japan. Then lithium-ion battery, which is probably heart of today's civilization. We cannot think about our life with a mobile phone, and mobile phones cannot work this long if it is not powered by a lithium-ion battery. So this lithium-ion battery, this work was done by, as you can see, I have written, uh, good enough, Ijabi, and Akira Yoshino in 1980. And after a long 39 years, it got Nobel Prize in Chemistry just last year. But we, are, we were using, everyone is using mobile phone, everyone is using lithium ion battery. 3D printing, this is another discovery from Asia. Basically, using the CAD model, the a object is created, and then that CAD drawing on the computer is released to the machine layer by layer, and these layers are formed to give the net shape. It's called additive manufacturing. LED, <coughs> then LED I have talked about. Now I'll talk about LCD televisions. Uh, all of you know, you know, it uses uh, much less space than conventional televisions. And today it has replaced all the, you know, conventional televisions. Android, this is where, this was also developed by a Japanese group uh, for intelligent robots. And it was primarily uh, developed by a team which was directed by Hiroshi Ishiguro at Osaka University and Kokoro company. Then digital audio, yet another discovery from Asia, changed the world. This is a sound that has been recorded and then converted into digital form. In digital audio, the sound wave of the audio signal is encoded as numerical samples in continuous sequence. So this is another marvelous discovery. Now, all these are basically called, uh, sorry, I changed, I, I forgot, uh, I, uh, uh, I mean, uh, microprocessor, fiber optic communication, QR code, lithium ion battery I mentioned, but this change was not affected. Uh, next slide, where I spoke about 3D printing, LCD televisions, Android, and digital audio. So basically emerging science uh, and engineering subjects, new subjects that are to be inculcated are molecular engineering, synthetic biology, smart macromolecules and intelligent materials, manufacturing by self-assembly of materials, self-learning, real-time in vivo sensor, flexible electronics, and microfluidics. Now, no sooner effect of third industrial revolution was settled, some people say that we are uh, in the era of fourth industrial revolution, which is industry 4.0, 
and it is basically rise of a connected ecosystem as you can see here i have tried to explain additive manufacturing augmented reality robotics cyber security machine to machine communication internet of things cloud computing big data analytics these are you know basically connectivity of physical space and cyber space so one industry need not operate in one physical location it can integrate you know several sub systems which are physically located elsewhere but connected in cyber space so uh, basically you know operational technology and information technology these two are you know confluence of you know these two uh, streams in a seamless manner you can see one of the uh, plants uh, automot uh, automobile plants in india uh, which deploys robots and uh, the deployment rate is about 58 robots per 10000 employees so this is such a new paradigm not very well understood subjects related to it are big data analytics internet of things artificial and neural network deep learning and genetic algorithm basically you know instead of going for fundamental modeling on some devices one can go to the functional modeling and establish a cause and effect causality system through logics through arguments and that gives a device or something that will eventually produce multiple replications so if we go to all these first second third fourth industrial revolutions we can see that we need a seamless integration of physical space cyber space and life sciences now subjects like data and image analysis genomics proteomics biomics big data analytics bioinformatics artificial intelligence robotics real time in vivo sensors biochips all these are to come to the curriculum as subjects if not subjects as module i'll explain it little later so something has to be dropped some mechanisms have to be designed now i have given the a model paradigm of requirements we still need mathematics physics chemistry biology and basic environment science as a basic science in engineering then engineering science in engineering like basic electronics engineering mechanics introduction to computing graphics introduction to manufacturing science etc will remain as important then solid mechanics fluid mechanics transport phenomena quantum chemistry electrical drives geosciences material science <coughs> trace analysis vibration dynamics data structure analog electronics digital electronics big data analytics these will come during fourth fifth and sixth semester as basket of options depending on a student's discipline and a student's desire they are to be allowed to you know go for these courses then courses like you know humanities and social sciences including communication skills and economics that is a must in the today's in today's world now having finished up to four semesters you know or six semester the departmental semesters or you know seventh or eighth semester uh, one <coughs> students are to be given department specific subjects and the newer subjects newer developments you know 
in third, fourth industrial revolutions. Now these subjects are emerging subjects. As I said, probably you know big data analytics will be needed by everybody. Probably Internet of Things will be needed by everybody. Probably you know, some biological aspects, you know, uh, genomics, uh, protein structure will be needed by everybody. So these are not to be offered as full courses. These are to be offered as modular courses. So maybe in another discussion, we can uh, talk about administering the modular courses. And together, of course, we need vocational education and uh, skills and training. So basically, grand challenges of this civilization, if you look at it, are the following. Sustainability, security against disaster, and this security against disaster, disaster can be natural disaster, man-made disaster, healthcare system, and enhancing human capability and job. So our industrial revolutions are outcome of our knowledge, but sometimes they have overtaken the growth of the subjects. Sometimes subjects have overtaken or subjects have developed huge amount of knowledge to give a birth to a new invention. So these are, you know, synergistic development. Now I will just touch upon another paradigm, which is a very new paradigm. It was not originally in my talk, but everybody is probably keen to know about it, about the post-corona scenario. So we have to go online. So online distribution of teaching material is important. But if we teach online, don't see the students, it's a difficult situation. Maintaining all this, you know, distance and all such things, we can have periodic meeting, periodic meeting, not with the entire class, we can split a class into, you know, 10 parts, you know, social distancing, etc. We maintain and in a batch wise manner, we can meet them, meet those, meet the students because if we can meet, you know, um, uh, intermittently, the, you know, growth will be sustained or the development of the subject. Some involved take home assignments are to be devised, ensure content creation and distribution, that is to be students are to be given the content a priority. We have to stay connected, maintain physical distance. Laboratories are to be remodeled. Again, you know, usually undergraduate laboratory or even postgraduate laboratory, a group performs an experiment. But now probably no longer that can be allowed. You know, one student will perform experiment. At the most, if he needs help, two students will perform one experiment. And then we have to spread experiment throughout the semester. Students will come depending on, you know, their turn. Uh, so we are in a long, dark tunnel at this moment. When we emerge, our challenge will not uh, proceed exactly the way we were handling them before. It will be, you know, uh, handling new problems and uh, it, it will be a changed society. So remote education probably will be uh, recognized as alternative uh, for coming few years. And in that paradigm, again, creativity, flexibility, judgment, patience, resilience, these are the things to be really, we have to rely upon. Uh, what is needed to truly make the students feel safe, again, to go come back to the class. And also we have to revisit our student aid system because all the students are not financially well up to <clears throat> buy the equipments that they need uh, for remote learning, staying at home. Sometimes, you know, laptops are not there for, you know, some students, uh, internet facilities are not available. We have to pay some attention, some endowments, some funding, you know, are to be done. And, uh, 
I mean, our uh, business community, government, uh, different endowments are to be, uh, you know, involved in this activity. So it is well understood that academia is vanguard of industrial revolutions. Balancing the pedagogy of education and advancement of science and technology is a challenge. The requirements will be further modulated and modified during the post-corona period. We require to strive continuously to strike a balance for the benefit of the mankind. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Huh. Yes. Uh, I could not see it. I mean, uh, is it? Uh, should I should I uh, uh, stay full screen or come back? You can enter and uh, take over. So uh, I will uh, uh, withdraw the slides. OK. Uh, I have not got it as yet. Can you see me? Accept, yes, I have accepted. I have accepted. Uh, what do you need? I'll, I'll give that. Uh, I'll open the mail. Uh, but mail is not having that. Okay, so you can, uh, you take the full control.
ओके 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 Uh, I can see one question here. Uh, what is the use of understanding industrial revolution as a fresher? Uh, it's 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 a huge important, hugely important because see, yeah. Uh, shall I shall I answer here? Okay, this uh, question was asked by. uh b n shivarama uh so uh, see yeah, today we are uh, enjoying the fruits of revolution industrial revolution in the different devices that changed our life that uh, you know uh, that is helping our you know uh, ways of ways and means of life now how these were made how the scientific knowledge you know finally contributed to new invention and those new inventions you know contributed in creating new devices and those the devices which are helpful for the human being for different purpose then uh, uh second question is how to improve agriculture healthcare and defense with this yes see for improvement of agriculture you need understanding of plant biology you have to you know again the way several devices were shown you have to go for you know Uh, basic innovations through those you know uh, biological uh, no, i mean devices biological i mean knowledge of biology healthcare system is similar way today you know it's basically it's 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 a it's a, a confluence of you know understanding of biology you know chemistry the uh, organic chemistry our uh, pharmacology and you know how the health responses to it all such things so again you know uh, i have just tried to say that scientific knowledge helps us to go for a new device and that new device contributes to our you know need and when the need is defined for meet and you will see it's not a single subject it's basically you know chemistry biology engineering medicine so and that is how it will it, we have to develop so whole idea is that how i i could not cover the entire paradigm everything i just tried took the example of you know few devices few technologies and how those were developed you know through scientific knowledge basically you know this is back and forth and then again new devices will create something new which will be a new science so how to really play with this effectively for the benefit of human kind economic growth during the pandemic situation yes that is obvious you know entire world is suffering from uh, you know economic growth because our productions are uh, hindered our regular life is not uh, on a proper track so from everywhere we are trying to you know address the issue i have addressed few issues related to academia how we can still continue our teaching learning process our <coughs> conducting exam and all but 
you know the same is the situation everywhere you know for the industry for uh, 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 i mean uh, business world uh, for healthcare system for hospital system so uh, this is a big challenge and we have to brainstorm think and take advice from leading economists take advice from you know people who can analyze the situation who can devise mechanisms in a more intense manner it's not that i know everything we have to you know collectively work for it please convey my heart full warm wishes to all those who started nptel live sessions it's your vision helping to get knowledge shared by great professors obviously see <clears throat> i mean uh, since i was involved in nptel from very beginning it is a great vision of uh, professor m s anand who was who is who is former director of iit madras and as i mentioned that he was helped by professor mangal sundar professor anup re professor shiv gaukar professor kushal sen uh, i also contributed little bit uh, and all of us took up this responsibility of you know converting you know uh, uh creating rather first creating video courses audio courses uh, and i uh, uh, web based courses web based planning material and then you know creating question bank converting all these video courses into like full fledged courses where even proctored examiner examinations can be uh, organized and surely they have taken a new initiative and i was invited to give a talk on this topic and this topic obviously a vast topic i could not cover everything but i have given indication that how a knowledge based system can be evolved and how interactivities industrial revolution and creation of new knowledge thank you for giving opportunity for learning about this link how can academia be kept uh, uh, in the next century don't worry you know uh, this uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, our vaccine will definitely uh, be discovered corona will be definitely be combated but till that point of time we have to survive and we are we are emerging into a new academia where online courses will be the basic lifeline and then you know maintaining social distancing and all such you know restriction we can invite students by turn to the institute to conduct Uh, experiments and maybe for viva voce or some other uh, devices for grading and uh, conducting examinations what are the present hot topics of research which can be done in india without going to america or europe how to pursue research career in india today in india see if you want to go to america or europe absolutely no problem you can always go it is good to go also to learn what other what is being done in other systems but today you can do research in india on any advanced topics whether it is in iits or indian institute of science or tifr or icers or some you know well known universities or some institutes some dst institutes some csir labs you know the knowledge is 
available devices are available culture is there and any advanced topic you name you can probably pursue research in india dr gautam biswas very excellent speech overall superior program thank you very much good okay thank you very much uh, very good topic this is uh, adil kumar uh, shashi kumar ramesh uh, one after another three names i did not i, I was only reading the reading through the uh, comments uh, the uh, feedback came from so far i have covered uh, you kubera देश बंधु बर्मन लक्ष्मी प्रभाकर अलग राजा रिनो बीच रेपेलो प्रथमेश मिस्टर रमेश ए शुड बी डॉक्टर रमेश ए पी एच डी शशि कुमार आदिल कुमार नेक्स्ट कमेंट इज फ्रॉम spurti saksena how to gauge the pavement in new revolution is how to gauge and pavement in new pavement of pavement new revolution in ident is identified integration of physical space and the cyber space via digital route it is a call for more connected world with my knowledge obviously you are absolutely right it's a call for more connected world through cyberspace and it is basically connecting and integrating different physical spaces through the cyberspace and uh, even as difficult as automobiles you know can be produced that way as difficult as a railway system i was about to talk on this a remote driving of a car over a network a city bus system maybe a pilotless uh, you know uh, trains on the tent tra- on the tracks so all these uh, you know are basically a type of you know applications of uh, fourth industrial revolution and you know through control mechanism through the you know digital connectivity you can control you know vehicles you can control production you can control you know several physical systems with a centralized you know control system which is basically a cyber system next is uh, ravindranath who uh, is uh, not written anything uh, excellent session i do not uh, Uh, nothing uh, nazir very good kalimulla uh, said in industry 4.0 human labor yes industry 4.0 is human labor is required answer is very difficult in you know uh, succinct manner human labor definitely required but human labor will be reduced only thing is that in order to perfect it more without having reduced human labor human can i mean can be impl- uh, deployed to for the monitoring or for the flawless operation or for looking into other aspects it's a different paradigm it requires uh, really you know different discussion what is the state of next one is uh, kranti kiran what is the state of science and engineering research in india academia india is importing defense and other industrial equipment worth 1000 crores rupees from foreign countries what does it take to design develop and make in india yes you know you are very much right efforts are on but you know you have to understand in this world 
uh, it's not today's competitive world it is not uh, possible for a country to do everything by uh, itself uh, by that uh, country so even if you look at you know uh, so called very you know rich countries i can give you an example uh, this uh, all these advanced uh, military aircrafts uh, these are designed developed in united states but several components are manufactured in japan several uh, it's it's on board computer system is designed and fabricated in taiwan so one country cannot do everything by you know uh, within that uh, its own system it has to take help from others we are on that track and uh, you know uh, our uh, you know economy should develop little more so that our poverty can be alleviated if we can break the you know this barrier uh, of uh, uh, economically downtrodden uh, people if we can uplift them then our major problem is solved it's not you know it is defense or you know these or that advanced technology it is bit even between so called so to say quote and quote advanced countries or first world countries they also do that when japan developed uh, this uh, uh, bullet train uh, europe did not have but uh, today europe has tvg europe had uh, has a, but uh, in order to develop that high speed uh, railway system in europe you know despite having everything in europe they had to you know collaborate with uh, several japanese companies so it's a flat world it's a kind of interconnected world next question is what about manpower in automobile available for robot and about security of life in robot so these are these are several facets of technology obviously these are to be developed i was narrating you know transition of our civilization our education system our industry so you know we have uh, adequate uh, components of advanced robotics whether it is electronics engineering whether it is mechanical engineering whether it is computer science so all the connected uh, disciplines are developed enough to uh, you know contribute uh, if there is a specific project if there is a specific target and we are indeed we are doing that our space program is very very successful program right a very few very few countries in the world has reached the level that we achieved in our space program very few countries in the world has reached a level of you know nuclear technology that we have achieved so it is you know it will happen we are we are we are on the track vikas kumar sahani so informative so innovative so inspirational thanks a lot sir thank you very much vikas you know if you are interested to learn more i i will come back again with maybe another advanced topic what was the most significant effect of industrial revolution see industrial revolutions you know it's not one industrial revolution see first industrial revolution converted hand loom into power loom basically you know motion was used in you know making things packaging things sending things transportation all such things second industrial revolution gave precise control because of emergence of microelectronics third industrial revolution you know 
gave even more accuracy because of nanotechnology, nanoelectronics, and you know, functionally graded material and all such things, and properly integrated with the biological paradigm, so that you know, proper healthcare system, non-invasive uh, diagnostic system, this can be developed. No question, it's Krishna. Next is Sandeep. Yeah, in future, what type of engineers are needed? Master of subject, jack of all. Today, software does most of the things just you need to give inputs and so on. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is software doesn't do all the things. If you look at FEM, if you look at CFD, CFD software cannot do all CFD problems. And uh, if somebody does not learn CFD as a subject, does not appreciate, you know, FEM, uh, every paradigm of FEM, he will not be able to use any FEM software, any CFD software, right? So software are being, softwares are being developed, but that is to help as a tool, but CFD knowledge, stress analysis knowledge related to FEM, these are needed. Excellent lecture, Professor Biswas. This is Arun Datta, Kolkata. Uh, look forward with lecture in future. Thank you, Dr. Datta. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Anand Kumar. Lecture was thought-provoking, helped us gain broader picture. I have few questions. Where India is located in um, your academic excellence? See, again, this is a question, um, you know, it, it has a, uh, you know, a very sort of, uh, uh, not uh, it can, cannot be answered in one sentence. See, in India, if you look at, I, I mentioned it already, if you look at uh, IITs, if you look at uh, Indian Institute of Science, if you look at NITs, if you look at ISARs, if you look at TIFR, if you look at several uh, well-known, I do not want to mention about uh, name-wise, well-known state universities, uh, you will find, uh, you know, academic activities there, whether it is, you know, things related to BTEC program, things related to MTEC programs, or uh, PhD program, are at par with uh, anywhere in the world. But not in all the areas, not in all subjects, but it is there. And also, I do agree your concern, there are still some colleges, there are still some institutes where, you know, it's not at par with these institutes I named. And improvement is there, uh, improvement is needed in all those colleges, all those places. But, you know, uh, notwithstanding requirement of those improvements, obviously, wherever uh, you know, we have to improve the quality, we have to improve. But in many institutes, uh, we have that world-class quality. And we have to, you know, um, sort of climb the ladder of excellence. You know, we have to uh, make use of that and move forward. Uh, I missed something. So, we have talked about new paradigm of engineering curriculum. Has there been any initiative to standardize across all institutions? How our uh, institution equipped to embrace such uh, yes, see, this is uh, uh, Mr. M. K. Uh, Anyal. Um, uh, this is definitely needed, but uh, see, uh, this uh, I am not competent enough to give this answer because 
I do not uh, govern uh, engineering education throughout the country. These are the thoughts, these are the models, these are to be followed. The curriculum I mentioned about, but you know, it depends on the institutes, how do they adapt it? So even uh, do you think uh, that it is very easy to uh, convince one institute that is practicing you know, on some track to change the track, come to this track. You have to argue, you have to, you know, uh, give proofs, you have to sort of uh, convince them that, see, this is better, do this, adapt this. And it is a process of iteration. It will emerge, it will come. But, you know, we have to keep trying. Uh, next question is how chemical engineering can contribute uh, in chemical engineering can contribute to massively see I mean it's very you know uh, sort of inappropriate to comment on any discipline any whether it is chemical engineering or civil engineering or materials engineering or mechanical engineering or uh, electronics engineering see basically you know everywhere plenty of you know novelty can be brought about you talk about new medicines you talk about new diagnostic devices you talk about you know basically uh, new products new polymers anywhere chemical engineering is uh, one such engineering that is applicable in plenty of places and uh, you have marvelous opportunity to contribute uh, you know in new areas you are from uh, you know uh, uh, kanpur so please come to our chemical engineering department sometime Mm, you know, uh, you will be amazed uh, looking at the scope of uh, chemical engineering in improving life, in improving technology, in improving, you know, uh, medicine, in improving healthcare system, several, several aspects. Uh, I get information about different uh, invention. That is nice. How this lockdown situation, this is uh, Triveni Prasad Banerjee, lockdown situation can be used by students and uh, motivated towards technology. See, again, this lockdown situation is an interim period. Now it is struggle between, you know, existence and non-existence you know it is a struggle for life so you know uh, we have to abide by this but within this if we can maintain link with the students if we you know uh, can uh, start online classes and also maybe as i said one is uh, online lectures Another is uh, inviting the students by turn to the institute. For example, uh, you are uh, uh, from uh, Durgapur, uh, maybe think about NIT Durgapur. Think about any discipline, see digital image processing in electronics. Now, the faculty members, maybe there are two or three faculty members in this area, they can join together, can create some quizzes, can create some homework. And the uh, faculty member who is teaching in this semester, he or she may de start delivering the online lectures. Now, it is certain that all the students do not have laptops, all the students do not have good internet facilities. So students who do not have internet facilities, they are to be invited to the campus, maintaining social distancing norms. And students who cannot afford laptop, 
university or institute has to take a decision to you know give them laptop on loan or whatever and maybe that particular subject after maybe you know one month of online lecture you know next month can be spent to call those students maybe for or maybe full three months lecture maybe 10 weeks lecture they can be called by turn to appear for the exams if it is uh, 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 a theoretical subject if it is a uh, if it is an experimental subject then obviously similar way uh, the time management has to be done by turn students have to be called and you know again maintaining social distancing norms that one experiment should be done not more than two students and a group of students that they come from uh, come for performing experiments they will be residing in some hostel and in that hostel again you know distance and single room and all such things should, has to be maintained and then uh, you know they will go back another batch will come so the you know it's a local solution depending on the, the student population the institute uh, thinkers planners have to plan so that you know it can continue so we have to it is like you know uh, in the game of cricket there are some overs when you have to slog overs you have to you know just keep on Uh, batting without losing wicket so it is something like that maybe you know as i said the medicine is discovered we will emancipate from this situation and we will start our new life everything will go back on the uh, usual track but till that point of time you know we have to keep on you know trying you know and stay in touch stay connected efficiency will not be you know comparable or will will not be like uh, <clears throat> the physical system as it used to be but you know students will not forget the subjects teachers will not you know forget the students and all such things you know and through mutual uh, understanding discussion things will keep on progressing uh raja mani uh, excellent topic uh, growing tech is useful to human being but how about health issues and environment uh, protection why the thermodynamic subject not mentioned in the list of human oh i mean if i have not mentioned any subject please you know excuse me it's not that i have you know ignored any subject i have igno- I, i have covered you know certain areas certain paradigms so i mean the things that are uh, directly linked i have mentioned thermodynamics is evergreen subject any time and every time you know it is needed you cannot violate laws of thermodynamics anywhere even if in your personal life right thermodynamics is so accurate so it is implicitly applied you know uh, i did not mention but you know obviously see i mentioned about electrochemistry i mentioned about battery i mentioned about fuel cell now all these things if you want to perfect if you want you know to design if you want uh, product you have to know very good advanced thermodynamics there is no question of it question about it uh orijit mukherji nice uh, thank you very much uh, orijit uh, thank you sir for this this is sandeep sarkar for this illuminating talk it is uh, indeed an excellent session my question is uh, will machine learning on big data analysis take over conventional research methodologies in future i don't think so you know this is my understanding of course but you know it will be useful 
See, uh, if uh, I can give you, you know, some example. Mm. Oh, you are from Jadavpur University. Okay, you are Sandeep. I know you very well. So, <laughs> you are my former student. Uh, you are very right. In your research paradigm, for example, you work on turbulence, you work on heat transfer, you work on, you know, fluid mechanics. Now, when you solve a problem, a type of problem you are solving now, you are writing fundamental equations, you are discretizing them, fitting your finite volume model, you are <coughs> solving a complex problem, going for grid independence, very rigorously, you know, checking everything and results you are producing is 100% accurate. Now, everywhere this, uh, you know, machine learning or big data will not replace it. See, you have to train a system. Like what you are doing, you have to do same thing on experiment. You have to do another study uh, through numerical route, another experiment, another related, uh, uh, almost related uh, topic, yet another uh, uh, experiment, another numerics. So you do some series and then you train a neural network system to understand that and set it up. And so that that can be used elsewhere where a very quick solution is needed. Say what is going on? Somewhere some heat exchanger, some heat exchanger is there. Its performance parameters are to be optimized or to be known so that it should be reduced or it should be enhanced or whatever. Very quickly you have to use, you use this model, which will give you some uh, answer. But you can be assured that answer is, you know, at the most, you know, it will be 90% accurate. Mostly it will be 60%, 70% accurate, accurate. But you get an estimation, first cut, you know, parameters by using this. So mostly this big data analytics or machine learning in usual engineering subjects, uh, whether it is mechanical engineering or fluid mechanics, heat transfer or civil engineering or stress analysis or chemical engineering, you know, uh, some uh, uh, process uh, uh, development, uh, name any engineering. You can substitute this as to gather, capture, first cut, you know, uh, values or parametric values for an unknown situation. So it has some utility, but it can never compare with your own model, with your own, you know, a, a computational or experimental accuracy. Good session, sir. This is uh, Mohesh. Uh, share more information. Thank you, Mohesh. Very good session, uh, Parveen. Uh, then uh, uh, Naj, uh, uh, innovation essential. Obviously, innovation essential, but see, innovation, today we, I mean, you don't mind for this comment. I'm not, uh, it's not meant for you. You understand. But innovation is very wrongly understood. People think anything new is innovation or even people confuse it with invention. See, innovation has a financial angle. Anything innovative means one can reap financial benefit out of it. Finally, it is applicable. It is it it, it will be, it will help in product development, component development, right? It has a market value. So obviously, innovation is essential. You are absolutely correct. But innovation may not come without having proper knowledge. See, just compare Louis Pasteur and uh, our <coughs> um, maybe uh, 
see louis pasteur developed uh, this vaccine for uh, uh, i mean uh, in order to develop the vaccine he had to really understand in depth biological system in depth uh, you know reactions in depth you know uh, chemistry otherwise it is not possible so that is why i am saying that and vaccine is basically an innovation so but innovation is linked to also fundamental knowledge chennai uh, sorry and uh, i have not finished i, I was talking about edison thomas alva edison edison is you know symbolized for uh, uh, innovation so maybe everybody is not uh, edison or so lucky right i mean several areas especially with uh, uh, human health simple innovation or thought may not fructify without very thorough understanding and you know in depth knowledge uh we lasni branding and marketing uh, branding and marketing is needed obviously but um, what answer is uh, expected i could not understand yes branding and marketing is essential for commercial world is academia vanguard uh, industrial revolution a useful session this is uh, gobalan uh, thank you which area do you suggest for phd in mechanical engineering currently all the areas right uh, if you are work, you want to work in robotics uh, manufacturing fluid mechanics heat transfer microfluidics microfluidics is a subject which is doing miracles in the world right right from cancer diagnostics to you know uh, new materials everywhere microfluidics uh, is contributing a lot so i mean stress analysis vibration every field is exciting you have to be excited about some idea now uh, don't look at other things look at your own excitement what excites you most what excites you most do that in this lockdown how can one improve his skills in reading journal this is a very very serious question in this lockdown period uh, reading journals etc very difficult unless your institute uh, does not subscribe to those journals yes if the institute sub subscribes to those journal if your institute subscribes to some journals with your institute mail id if the flag can identify your institute then you will be able to read those journals otherwise it's a difficult situation i do agree um, but uh, you know in order to find some way out you have to go for those online journals which have open access it will not serve all the purposes but you know there are some open access journals these journals some are very good very high level open access journals some are not some are money churning because they take money for uh, getting a paper published but some very high level journals like nature communication even nature communication if somebody publishes a paper he has to pay and why he has to pay because this journal is open to everybody so you know they will not not earn otherwise they will earn from the uh, you know authors 
whether that philosophy is correct or not, uh, it is arguable. Uh, I do not personally like that philosophy, but as I said, it's an information that there are many open access journals. Some open access journals are not at all useful. They are, you know, basically just uh, making money. But some open access journals are extremely good. And but you can anytime log in, like Nature Communication. It's an open access journal, and you can find topics of any discipline there. You know there, so you can you know log into it, and then you know uh, you can search the paper of your field of paper in the paper, field of your interest and read that. Um, uh, next question is COVID uh, is COVID-19 ratio controlled in India but <laughs> they, these are I am not really knowledgeable COVID-19 you know <laughs> uh, I mean uh, this is uh, uh, I only I, uh, I mean we are on the same boat I mean uh, uh, I do not know anything better um, I only read in newspapers or uh, see in televisions that countries like Vietnam or countries like New Zealand uh, and uh, like that two, three countries, New Zealand, Vietnam, Sweden, uh, they are, uh, they did not lock down and they controlled it in such a manner from the beginning that uh it's not these countries are not affected but uh, many many countries are affected also and uh, in the united states is the most affected country so <laughs> how to make a country corona free or you know less affected uh, these are really you know experts can say uh, we are you know in this matter I have no knowledge. Uh, Shuvankar Ganguly. Good evening, sir. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I know Dr. Shuvankar Ganguly. He is a scientist in Tisco, Tata Steel. Uh, thank you, Shuvankar. Thank you very much. Uh, Ramana Bali. So I have answered uh, many questions. Uh, yes, I thank you very much. Uh, how is your experience? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, fine. Sir, no. Very well, sir. You, you answered all the questions. Sir. Usually, people.